a more invisible co-director of the Russian Eurasia program, uh, taking Chris Miller's normal place here. Um, I'm happy to welcome uh, Joshua Keating, uh, who will be talking about uh, his book, Invisible Countries. Uh, Joshua was a staff writer uh, and editor at Foreign Policy Magazine, um, and then after that, and is currently uh, writing for Slate Magazine, where uh, he is the author of one of what I thought was the funniest genre of satirical writing that has become progressively less funny over time, not through any of, of Josh's fault. Because he started writing a series of what would it look like if a foreign correspondent covered the United States the way a U.S. correspondent would cover a developing country, like some bizarre cultural ritual there. Um, and so like he would write articles about what the Super Bowl means to the United States. And I would highly recommend looking at this corpus. The problem, of course, is that as, as time is uh, has passed, the United States increasingly resembles uh, one of those very developing countries that requires that kind of coverage, so uh, it becomes slightly less funny. But, more importantly, um, we're here to hear uh, uh, Joshua talk about his book, uh, Invisible Countries, about sort of countries that are existing yet don't exactly exist. And so I believe the format, you're going to read for a few passages and then hopefully take questions from the very interested audience, uh, and I will be happy to moderate those questions if you want. Thank you. But otherwise, uh, please give a round of applause for Josh. Thanks so much, Dan, and thanks to everyone for coming and to uh, Lecture School for hosting. This is probably the last uh, event I'm doing for the book, so it's, it's a real honor to do it here. Um, I've, I've, you know, in this setting, I think probably uh, like a lot of the students here, I, I'm somebody who grew up uh, kind of you know, mildly obsessed with uh, maps and geography and, and countries. And um, I used to have this book that was a kind of encyclopedia of world geography. It was sort of a list of countries with, um, you know, each one had a little neat little uh, description. Um, and, you know, sort of constantly reread this. Um, but, you know, I, I kind of became aware of the world at a time of kind of transformation of the world map. It was around. Uh, you know, the uh, fall of the Berlin Wall, the break of the Soviet Union, the uh, break of Yugoslavia. And so I, I definitely early on developed this idea that maps were something fluid and you could have a map one year and two years later it would be out of date. And uh, you know, that was sort of, but by the time I started doing this professionally, when I became a journalist focused on international affairs, that really wasn't the case anymore. Um, you know, in the 21st century, uh, there have been only three newly independent countries that have become UN member states, full UN member states, and the creation of new countries has become pretty rare, and uh, secessionism and the kind of control of territory is maybe not as uh, salient an issue uh, for us who think and write about international politics as it once was. And uh, I sort of got interested in why that was, uh, you know, first around 2008, which is when Kosovo declared its independence when there was the war between Russia and Georgia, which uh, resulted in Russia's recognition of the two breakaway regions, Abkhazia and South Ossetia. And that got me interested in the question of how do you make a new country, you know, and who gets to decide uh, when a country becomes a real one? Uh, and so, you know, my, our, uh, my boss, Dan, also worked with Blake Council uh, at Foreign Policy, he used to always make fun of me because there'd be some major news story happening, and I would want to be writing about Nagorno-Karabakh. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, so this was kind of a side interest of mine for a long time, but, it, you know, around 2014, I think it sort of started to seem a little less niche, and uh, some of the things that were happening then, there was, in Scotland had a referendum on independence, uh, the Islamic State emerged in uh, Syria, and uh, you know, proclaimed its goal of you know, redrawing the Sykes-Picot borders in the Middle East and uh, you know, erasing the border between Iraq and Syria. Uh, Russia, of course, annexed Crimea, which sort of the first sort of forceful uh, uh, annexation of territory in Europe in decades. Uh, all of a sudden, there was all this coverage about China building artificial islands in the South China Sea as a way of extending its territorial claims. So. You know, some things that I thought had been a kind of um, niche interest was all of a sudden very much in the daily headlines. 
And uh, it seemed like a good idea uh, to kind of explore that in a little more depth than what I'm able to do in my day job. And all of that is kind of a long way of explaining how it was that in the summer of 2016, I found myself on the coast of the Black Sea at a soccer tournament for unrecognized countries. Uh, so I'm going to read a little bit about that. Uh, it was close to dusk on the Black Sea coast when the parade of imaginary countries began. On the surface, it was an event not unlike the opening ceremonies of any other international sporting event. Sequin divas belted cheesy inspirational pop ballads. Choreographed masses of dancers performed a tribute to the glorious history of the host nation. Athletes, most with little hope of making it past the early rounds of competition, mugged for selfies and proudly waved their flags. But the 12 teams that had made their journey to the World Football Cup in Abkhazia in June 2016 were representing countries that are not at all like those at the Olympics or the World Cup. And none of the flags that paraded through the stadium that night are on display outside UN headquarters in New York City. These are countries that most people don't consider countries at all. The World Football Cup, which is organized by the Confederation of Independent Football Associations, or COMIPA, is where countries compete when they don't meet the threshold of statehood required for membership in bodies like FIFA, the IOC, or for that matter, the UN General Assembly. Some were the type of places that are described in news reports by dismissive phrases like breakaway, semi-autonomous, or self-proclaimed. The host country, Abkhazia, was one such, de facto independent since breaking off from newly independent Georgia in a devastating civil war that ended in 1993, but today recognized by only Russia and three other countries. Actually, now it's four, but at the time it was. Uh, as far as the United States and Europe were concerned, this event was being held in Georgia. A team represented the Kurds, the largest ethnic group in the world without its own state, but one that was now tantalizingly close to achieving the dream of independence. Somaliland, the unlikely and unrecognized beacon of stability in the Horn of Africa, was also there as was northern Cyprus, the Turkish-dominated northern half of the Mediterranean island. Some themes represented groups wronged by history. The Western Armenia contingent was representing a Turkish-Armenian community decimated during World War I. The Chagos Islanders, originally from a small archipelago in the Indian Ocean, but now living largely in the Crawley area of London, were evicted from their home islands by the British government in 1971, so the United States could build a military base on Diego Garcia, in expulsion, the islanders continue to challenge in domestic and international courts. Other teams represented ethnic minorities who found themselves on the wrong side of international boundaries, such as the Koreans of Japan or the Hungarians of Romania. A Punjabi team purported to represent not only the historical region, today divided between the countries of India and Pakistan, but the global Punjabi diaspora. A Sami team represented an indigenous group living in northern Scandinavia that has achieved a significant level of political autonomy in recent years. Rounding out the competition were some European regions, Padania, or Northern Italy, and Raetia, a Romansh-speaking region of Switzerland, that seemed less interested in making a political statement than just playing some football. This team is not like a political thing. I think Italy is fine the way it is, the Padania goal goalkeeper told me at the opening ceremony. At the opposite end of the intensity scale was Harpreet Singh, a 33-year-old London accountant who had quit his job and poured his life savings into building the Punjabi team. He told me, I don't consider myself Indian. The Indians have perpetrated atrocities against Punjab. I don't consider myself British. I don't hate them, but I choose not to be associated with being British. Only the hardiest fans of esoteric international soccer made the long trip to Ocasio to watch the tournament, but a fair number of foreign reporters were there, attracted by the quirky spectacle of a World Cup for countries that don't exist. The event was also a blatant propaganda exercise for the hosts, a place that doesn't, that doesn't rate highly for news coverage, even compared to other participants in the frozen conflicts of the post-Soviet world. It was easy to be skeptical about the event, and CONIFA, an Isle of Man-based body staffed by a skeleton crew of volunteers, but I appreciated the open-minded approach to nationhood taken by the event. CONIFA currently has 47 members. And no, you can't just declare your local pub an independent nation and start a football team. <laughs> New members are decided on by a vote of the existing membership and generally have to be semi-autonomous states or minority groups represented, recognized by international NGOs. Still, a few members, such as Cascadia, a region of Oregon, Washington, and British Columbia, seemed a bit dubious to me. More than any other activity, 
except for perhaps war, for which they often serve as a metaphor, sports can bring the world's countries into contact with each other. You don't have to buy the kumbaya platitudes of glorified criminal rackets like FIFA and the IOC to acknowledge the, the appreciation of athletic competition, particularly the world's most popular sport, has a rare ability to cut across national boundaries, even as it incites national pride. There was something undeniably poignant in the alternate history of the world that the event displayed. If a few battles, peace conferences, and revolutions had turned out differently, it's not at all hard to imagine an alternate historical timeline in which Punjab, Padani, and Kurdistan are established countries with seats at the United Nations and teams in the Olympics, while Pakistan, Italy, and Iraq are merely the fanciful notion of dreamers and fanatics. The event was a useful reminder that the map of the world that we all know today is the product of a series of accidents and historical processes that could just as easily have gone the other way. And since we're here, and this is a Russia and Eurasia gathering, I'm going to read a little more about uh, what it's like to cross the border into Abkhazia, which is its own experience. Uh, crossing the border into Abkhazia viewed by most of the world's governments as a Russian-backed outlaw enclave, is not as forbidding as you might think. The country does have an airport, but Georgia doesn't permit commercial flights in or out, so the only planes that use it are Russian military transports. That means travelers looking to enter are advised to choose from one of two land crossings. The players and officials at the Kanifa World Football Cup cross the internationally recognized border with Russia, a bit south of the Olympic city of Sochi. Most of the journalists covering the event, including myself, looking to avoid the expense and hassle of acquiring a double-entry Russian visa, opted for the much more controversial crossing on the Georgian side. I reached the Inguri River, which forms the western border between Georgia and Abkhazia, on a cloudy and blustery day, feeling very much as though I had blundered into a bad Cold War spy movie. I had taken the night train from Georgia's capital, Tbilisi, 200 miles west to the grim border town of Zubdidi, where I caught a marshrutka, one of the routed minibus taxis that are, prefer that are the preferred mode of public <coughs> transportation in the Caucasus, to the border, or the border, if you prefer. In keeping with the Georgian government's attitude toward this frontier, there's nothing along the road indicating that you're approaching an international boundary. The Marshuka lets out at a Georgian police roadblock, manned by one board police officer and a few stray dogs. I had been advised by the organizers of the tournament not to identify myself as a journalist to the Georgian authorities and, more important, not to in any way suggest that Abkhazia was not part of Georgia. So as far as this gentleman was concerned, I was simply a backpacker touring the Caucasus. If the officer were to ask me why on earth an American backpacker was trying to get into Abkhazia, I was to say, if I am in Georgia only once in my life, I want to see all of it, including Abkhazia. <laughs> This subject rouge proved unnecessary. The Georgian police officer, seemingly drunk at 9 a.m., simply gave my passport a quick once over and waved me through. From the checkpoint, it's about a two kilometer walk to, to the Pothold and Guri Bridge, where Abkhaz controlled territory begins. Cars aren't allowed to cross the bridge, so horse drawn carts are available to transport travelers and their luggage. I didn't have, a I didn't have much luggage, so I opted to walk. Cared for by neither government, the road is rapidly deteriorating. Small herds of cows wander aimlessly, oblivious to the geopolitical fault line beneath their hoofs. On either side of the road, the marshy no man's land looks overgrown and burdened. It reminded me of how the DMZ between North and South Korea has become an unofficial wildlife refuge used by a number of endangered bird species as an unmolested habitat. In those rare spots on Earth, the politics prevents humans from, cl from claiming, nature stakes its own claims. On the other side of the rusting bridge is a metal fence and a sign in three languages welcoming you to Abkhazia. Here is an inspection point run by the FSB, Russia's internal security service and one of the successor agencies of the KGB. We were shepherded into a holding area to await questioning. The setup was sinister enough. The armed guards summoned us one by one for individual questioning in a trailer surrounded by a maze of barbed wire at the border crossing. At the back of my mind was an incident caught on video the month before in which a Georgian man was shot by border guards under mysterious circumstances. But then my inquisitor, a baby-faced teenager, started quizzing me about, my, about hotel prices in the capital city of his own country, and then asked for my Facebook address, and I realized he was more interested in staving off boredom than in sussing out potential national security threats. The guard was also particularly interested in whom I had seen and what I had been asked on the other side of the bridge, 
as if one day an oblivious backpacker would inform him that there was a Georgian tank battalion just over the horizon <laughs> preparing to roll in. We may have been only a kilometer away from Georgia proper, but it felt like another world entirely. The vast majority of the planet is divided into well-defined and mutually recognized countries, but I had just crossed into a gray area. So the uh, format of the book is mostly built around these uh, five main examples, which are places I visited in 2016. And those are uh, Abkhazia, which I just mentioned, which I went to as an example of how kind of great power politics uh, uh, creates these ambiguous sovereignty situations. Uh, Abkhazia is obviously backed by Russia and a few countries that are allied with Russia, including most recently Syria, as the, uh, the fourth one I mentioned. Uh, and, you know, you ask people there uh, about this and, you know, that they point to Kosovo uh, as the kind of uh, counterexample that, you know, okay, if the West is going to recognize Kosovo, Russia is going to um, uh, recognize Abkhazia. This is kind of every conversation you have about sovereignty in Abkhazia somehow gets back to Kosovo. Um, another place I visited that was a little closer to home was a town called Akwesasne, which is a Mohawk community on the U.S.-Canada border. Uh, it's right where New York State, Ontario, and Quebec all meet. And the town uh, is actually divided by the border, and it's an interesting place because when you're in the community, the border basically doesn't exist. You can just walk across. Um, uh, there's no border checkpoint, but there are checkpoints on either side, and it's sort of just sort of in daily life for people who live there often involves crossing the international border. Um, and what I was interested in there was one that, you know, we think of the U.S.-Canada border as the kind of <coughs> stable and uh, unquestioned peaceful border you can imagine, but even there, there are kind of ambiguities people don't realize. And two, to look at the, an issue, the issue of um, you know, Native American or indigenous sovereignty in the U.S., uh, which is something that I think isn't really on the radar for most of us who study international affairs, we, do, we tend not to think of the semi-independent nations that exist uh, within our own country. Uh, third place I write about uh, is probably the best known, it's Iraqi Kurdistan. Uh, I visited in 2016, so at that point um, the battle for Mosul was still going on a few miles away. Uh, ISIS was still very much fighting in Syria. Uh, Iraqi Kurdistan was very stable, very peaceful, there wasn't um, much to worry about there, but it was a time when people were really feeling optimistic, I think because the uh, thought that the invasion of ISIS had kind of demonstrated that Iraq as a country didn't work, and it kind of bolstered their own claim for nationhood. Uh, obviously, since then, they've held a referendum, uh, and the kind of backlash to that, um, Iraq didn't recognize the referendum, retook the city of Kirkuk and several of the other contested areas, uh, and Kurdistan arguably, well, definitely has less territory and ar arguably has less political independence than it did before they held the referendum. So it's, uh, that's kind of an example of, you know, just even uh, the kind of best known, most supported uh, semi-independent cases, there's sort of limits to how much they can achieve. Uh, I visited Somaliland, um, which, as I mentioned, is a uh, basically known to the rest of the world as northern Somalia. And, you know, of all the places I visited, that in many ways felt the most, like, unquestionably independent. Uh, it's a place that has its own government. There, there's a conflict on the border, but uh, when you're there, you know, you, there's no question you're in independent Somaliland. There's a, there's a currency, there's a flag, there's a border, um, uh, they have their own armed forces. Uh, but, Somaliland is not recognized by a single other country. It's not even like Abkhazia, where they have one kind of main patron. Uh, uh, it's it's a totally under, like lives completely in this kind of geopolitical twilight realm. So that's what I was uh, interested in looking at there. And then the final place I visited was a small island country in the Central Pacific called Kiribati. Uh, it's spelled like Kiribati. So, um, but that is a place with a seat at the UN, it's, it's unquestionably independent. Uh, but the reason I went there is it's one of the countries that's most threatened by uh, sea level rise as a result of climate change. And uh, it's a place where the most recent government has actually discussed the prospect of having to relocate 
the entire population if, as the UN report that came out a few weeks ago predicts, that uh, we're on the verge of unstoppable sea level rise that will make uh, countries like Kiribati uninhabitable within the century. Uh, and something that people there and kind of international legal scholars are just starting to grapple with is this idea of whether their country can move, basically, whether it's possible to maintain some level of political independence if these people have to leave the territory, the physical territory that their nation is associated with. Uh, and sort of in between those big examples, I had a couple sort of smaller ones that I looked at. Uh, I acquired e-residency e in Estonia. Uh, I'm still trying to figure out what that gets me. Uh, I, I visited the UN mission of the uh, Sovereign Order of the Knights of Malta which is a, uh, a Catholic order that dates back to the Crusades, but has this sort of weird status in international law where they have embassies in several countries, um, they're recognized the sovereign, and they have observer status at the United Nations, and that's kind of a sort of throwback to uh, an era of world politics before uh, nation states were kind of the default. Um, the third of these little outlier examples that I went to, which I'm going to read a little bit about, is uh, place called Liberland, uh, and uh, well, I'll tell you a little about it. It was January 20th, 2017. I was just off the Washington Mall, where throngs of people in MAGA hats were gathering to watch Donald J. Trump be sworn in as the 45th President of the United States. But I was there to meet a different president. Vit Yedlichka of the Free Republic of Liberland due to meet me at, was due to meet me at the Federal Center metro station and was running late. I wrote in the first chapter that the world's landmass is now entirely claimed by one country or another, but this isn't completely true. There are still a few unclaimed patches here and there if you know where to find them, and Yedlichka had found one. In April 2015, he proclaimed a new nation on a 2.7 square mile territory on a riverbank between Croatia and Serbia. It would be the third smallest country in the world after Vatican City and Monaco. The land is subject to dispute, but unusually, the dispute is that neither country wants it. <laughs> it is under Croatian control, but the Croatian government wants to cede it in exchange for other parcels of land controlled by Serbia, so its status remains unresolved. Yedlichka is a member of the Czech Republic's libertarian, Eurosceptic Party of Free Citizens. In 2016, speaking to me via Skype from the roof of his embassy in Prague, he told me, I, just, I used to want to just make changes in Czech politics, I worked for five years to bring about more freedom, less regulation. Then it appeared to me one day that it would be much easier to find a new state than to change anything in Czech politics. The Free Republic of Liberland, he suggested, might be ideologically the strongest nation in the world. We all believe in freedom, that the government should be minimal, that taxes should be voluntary. It's a very strong idea. You can apply for citizenship online, and over 400,000 people have so far. And Yedlichka estimates that around 100,000 of them are serious about it. <laughs> My own application for citizenship seems to be languishing in the queue, perhaps because I've been ignoring the email suggesting that I donate to the project in order to gain merits towards citizenship. Also, I'm not actually a libertarian, and besides, I already electronically reside in Estonia. <laughs> Liberland, I say, with all respect to Yedlichka and his officials, is not quite in the same category as places like Somaliland, Abkhazia, or Akhazasini that people have fought and died for. But the questions the project raises are valid ones. If people from ostensibly democratic countries decide the laws of those countries aren't working for them, and are willing to go through the time and effort of setting up a new political unit, why shouldn't they be able to start a country of their own? Is the answer just that there isn't room for any more countries? What if they manage to find some? One small problem with the Liberland project is that at the moment, Croatia is preventing anyone from entering the territory. Yedlichka is undaunted by this hiccup. They are actually affirming our, camp, our claim by setting up very strong borders and saying that if you're going there, you're illegally leaving Croatia, he said. <laughs> Liberlanders have been approaching the territory by boat. <coughs> In September 2017, Liberland signed a memorandum of understanding with Somaliland, of all places, but has yet to gain recognition from any widely recognized country which Yedlichka says does not concern him. Recognition is not that important for us at this stage. First, we have to become a recognizable entity. 
The Liberland government does claim to be in contact with Pepe Grillo of the opposition Five Star Movement in Italy and is optimistic that it can build ties to Donald Trump's administration. He's an entrepreneur, and we're going to be entrepreneur friendly, he told me on the mall as we made our way through the gates toward our assigned section. I think he will understand how we strive to get rid of regulations. Maybe he will move the United States a little bit more toward Liberland. He also hoped that he could leverage the Czech children's the Trump children's Czech heritage to Liberland's advantage. He said he was in communications with the offices of several elected officials in D.C., but declined to name any he might be meeting with. Also on hand was Liberland's just appointed vice president, Bogi Wozniak, a mustachioed Chicago retiree originally from Poland. An enthusiastic Trump supporter, Wozniak had helped coordinate the publication of a Polish, transla Polish translation of the president's 2015 book, Crippled America. Polish title, Donald Trump, President Businessman. <laughs> he didn't see a contradiction in backing both the America First President and a nation-building project in the Balkans. First we make America great again, he told me, then Liberland. <laughs> Along with the crowd, we were funneled onto a knoll southwest of the Capitol steps that afforded a partially obstructed view of the Jumbotron. I thought we'd be a bit closer, mumbled one member of the Liberland delegation. For much of the ceremony, Yadlichka struggled to get a strong enough cell signal to live stream a message to people attending the opening of a new libertarian think tank in the Czech Republic. The man in a suit and tie speaking Czech into his phone got a few quizzical looks from the Trump supporters in the crowd around us. As Trump began rallying against trade deals and the loss of American jobs overseas, Yadlichka winced a bit. I'm not sure about this protectionism, he said. That's probably where we differ. The Liberlanders aren't the only people to have the idea of starting our new country on terra nullius. There's also a small patch in the desert between Egypt and Sudan that is claimed by neither country. In 2014, a Virginia man named Jeremiah Heaton gained media attention for traveling to the territory and proclaiming it the Kingdom of North Sudan. The coverage of his stunt focused on the parenting aspect of Heaton traveling halfway around the world so that his daughter could be a princess. Disney has acquired film rights to the story. <laughs> but Heaton claimed he had larger goals, telling me in an interview for Slate in 2015 that he aimed to create a city in the desert that maximizes the use of space and maximizes energy efficiency, providing a home for people who have a love of the earth and that want to help advance the science. The monopoly that countries have on the world's landmass is a problem for nationalist entrepreneurs. Except for these small patches, at least one government claims a monopoly on the use of force on every square inch of land in the world, and they tend not to give them up without a fight. Sure, my neighbors and I can proclaim our bloc to be an independent country, but the US government isn't going to take it well if we decide we don't have to pay taxes or follow the, follow the same laws that they follow one block over. This has led some dreamers to divide creative solutions to the territory problem. One of the more celebrated examples of an unrecognized country is the, play, is the Principality of Sealand, a micronation established on a disused 10,000 square foot British artillery platform in the North Sea by pirate radio DJ Patty Roy Bates in 1967. Sealand has a football team that participates in CUNIFA and has played exhibition games against Somaliland and Britain. The country has even experienced a brief military conflict in 1968 when Bates fired shots at a British boat. He was tried but acquitted on the grounds that he was outside British jurisdiction. The project was more durable than most microstates. Bates ruled it until his death in 2012. It still exists on the, under the rule of his son, but is a lot less active these days. Taking a page from Sealand's book, the Seasteading Institute, founded by Patrick Freeman, Patrick Friedman, grandson of free market economist Milton Friedman, is dedicated to building new political identities, new political entities floating in the open ocean. It's still theoretical at this point. But in 2016, the, inst the Institute signed a memorandum of understanding with French Polynesia they hope will pave the way for an actual seastead sea to be built in the territory's waters. Yadlichka takes a similar let a thousand nations bloom attitude. It would be very nice to have more Liberlands around the world, he said. Could small, autonomous, voluntary communities be our political future? For now, the odds are stacked against these projects, and it's something of a fringe movement. But it might not be impossible, and as Yedlitschka points out, not really any stranger than the countries we have today. It's funny, because they say Liberland is a virtual country, but so are all the other ones, he told me. It's nothing but the imagination of people that creates a country. Um, yeah, so, I mean, 
what the book kind of explores is both the reasons why we live in this kind of area, this era of stasis, why it's become <coughs> so rare for borders to change or new countries to be created. And I think, you know, a couple things changed in my thinking of it as I was working on the book. I mean, one, I was thinking maybe even if borders aren't changing, they're just becoming less relevant because of, you know, globalization and international trade and the internet and we're going to live in a, you know, global borderless community anyway. Uh, obviously, political events have not quite moved in that way uh, since I started working on this book, and uh, governments have come into power both in uh, North America and Europe that uh, have a very different attitude towards the importance of borders uh, to establish sovereignty and national identity. Uh, and another thing is that I think I used to be, uh, when I started the book, I was a little, I mean, I don't, I purposely don't take stands on any of these secession questions. I don't uh, say that one country or another should be independent or borders should be redrawn. I don't think it's really my place to come in and say that. That should be a question for the people who live there. But I think I was sort of uh, more uh, sympathetic to secessionism as a whole when I started. Uh, I had this idea that, yes, there are these colonial era borders in the Middle East and, and Africa, and that this is a sort of major driver of ethnic conflict. But I think, you know, after researching a little more and traveling to some of these places, is that, you know, drawing line, redrawing lines probably isn't going to solve most of the problems. And I, I get very um, wary when I hear people say, like, oh, we should just divide Iraq into three parts, you know, Sunni, Shia, and Kurd, and uh, that would solve all its problems. We should just you know, carve up Syria and Yemen, and, and uh, you know, the, then uh, ethnic conflict would go away. Uh, I think the track record for uh, peaceful partitions in history is pretty minimal. I mean, you know, there aren't that many uh, Czechoslovakias that you can point to. Much more often, you have examples like Yugoslavia or the partition of India, where um, a sort of partition on ethnic grounds is a prelude for border conflicts or ethnic cleansing. Uh, that's generally because of the problem of minorities, that when you, however you draw a line, uh, peoples uh, don't uh, separate themselves into neat little units. You can just draw a fence around. Uh, however you draw, the, wherever you draw the line, someone's probably going to end up on the wrong side of it. And if you're defining these countries by one ethnic group, if you're saying this is a Shia state, then uh, that becomes a problem for the uh, Sunnis that live within it. And uh, you know, one person who I met uh, who really kind of illustrated some of these dilemmas to me uh, was this guy named uh, Mikhail Sebastian. It was a really interesting story. And uh, I'm gonna, the last excerpt I'm going to read is going to be his story. Mikhail Sebastian just wanted to go on vacation. A Californian barista didn't realize he was going to be stranded in American Samoa for over a year. Travel is a little more complicated for him than it is for most of us. He's one of the more than 12 million stateless people living in the world today, meaning he's not a citizen of any country. The last country Sebastian was a citizen of was the Soviet Union. He's an ethnic Armenian born in Azerbaijan. When ethnic conflict broke out in the late 1980s, his family fled, <coughs> ending up in Turkmenistan. This wasn't a good long-term option. Sebastian is gay, and homosexuality is illegal in Turkmenistan. So in 1995, he came to the United States on a work visa, which he overstayed. He spent six months in jail in 2003, but was eventually released. U.S. authorities might have preferred to deport him at this point, but with only a Soviet passport, he had nowhere to go. The United States is a signatory to the 1954 U.N. Convention on Statelessness, which prevents countries from expelling stateless people unless on grounds of national security. So Sebastian was given a work permit. We all talk about illegal immigration, but people just ignore the issue of statelessness, Sebastian told me in a 2016 interview. More precisely, it irritates him when the US government ignores its own stateless population. Though there are no numbers on America's stateless population, the UNHCR report, report stated that between 2005 and 2010, around 628 stateless people applied for as asylum in the US, and around 1,887 presented themselves as stateless in immigration courts. Stateless people in the U.S. are generally, like Sebastian, former Soviet citizens who never obtained citizenship in any of the new states, immigrants from the former Yugoslavia, Eritreans who came to the United States as Ethiopian citizens, or Palestinians born in other Middle Eastern countries. 
Sebastian said, most stateless people in America keep a low profile. A lot of them send me emails, he said. A lot of them are scared to say anything. If you go to the immigration office and say, I am stateless, the first thing they're going to do is put you in a detention center. You can, sit there from, you can sit there from six months up to a year because there's no law protecting you, so they're just hiding. Sebastian, though, loves to travel. And this is a problem for stateless people, as the government considers it self-deportation if you leave the country and will not let you back in. So for years, he, cont he contented himself with travel to U.S. overseas territories like Puerto Rico, Guam, and in 2012, American Samoa. What he didn't quite realize at the time, though, is that American Samoa is a bit different. Unlike other U.S. possessions, it's not considered part of U.S. territory, and its inhabitants are not automatically U.S. citizens. Constitutionally, none of the residents of America's overseas possessions are entitled to birthright citizenship, which is a legacy of a series of blatantly racist court decisions uh, in the early 20th century that drew a distinction between North American territories destined for eventual statehood and the unincorporated territories like Puerto Rico and the Philippines that were recently acquired in the Spanish-American War. Birthright citizenship was eventually extended to these other territories by a statute, with the exception of American Samoa. All this meant that when Sebastian tried to return, he was told by immigration authorities that he had self-deported. It didn't help his case that he had unwittingly spent a few hours in Western Samoa, not realizing until he got there that Western Samoa is a separate independent country. He then spent over a year on the island, living with a local family on a $50 a week stipend, spending most of his days at a McDonald's, the only place he could find Wi-Fi. Bizarrely, he wasn't even the only stateless person stranded in, in Samoa. He said he met an East German woman who had married, then divorced a Samoan man, and found herself unable to leave since the country on her passport no longer, no longer existed, and she had missed the cutoff date to get a new Federal Republic of Germany passport. Sebastian said that at one point, frustrated, he wanted to give up trying to return to the United States and asked the UN High Commission on Refugees to help him emigrate to Europe or New Zealand, but they thought he had, better, he had a better case for getting back to the United States. Sebastian ended up being readmitted, but only after his story was featured on NPR and CNN. He was eventually granted asylum status and is currently awaiting legal residency. Now in the coffee import business, Sebastian travels frequently for work and has visited Rwanda, Ethiopia, Cuba, Ecuador, Panama, Guatemala, and El Salvador. His travel stories are peppered with anecdotes of hours long interrogations at airports and being pulled off buses at border checkpoints. Every time I have to go through customs, I get detained, he said casually. What I find remarkable about Sebastian is that in a situation in which most people would keep their head down rather than attract the attention of authorities, he persists in asserting his right to travel freely, more than willing to expose himself to inconvenience and even risk to do so. He didn't view this as anything particularly unusual. After all, if the rest of us can travel for work and pleasure, why shouldn't he, just because he was born in a country that no longer exists? In a speech defending Britain's exit from the European Union in October 2016, British Prime Minister Theresa May made the heavily criticized claim that, if you are a citizen of the world, you are a citizen of nowhere. Though meant to needle the jet-setting neoliberal elites who are aghast at Brexit, the remark was seen as insulting to refugees, immigrants, and the ever-growing number of people in the world with more than one national identity. But it also reflects the unco unconscious biases of a world of countries and stasis. We assume today that every human being must be a citizen of somewhere. The UN Declaration of Human Rights states that everyone has a right to a nationality. But a less benign way of putting that might be that in our current world system, everyone is required to have a nationality. People like Sebastian are an inconvenience and irritation to the nation-state system. This philosopher Ernest Gellner wrote, a man must have a nationality as he must have a nose and two ears. A deficiency in any of these particulars is not inconceivable and does from time to time occur, but only as a result of some disaster. And it is itself a disaster of a kind. A creative solution to this problem is the World Passport, issued by the Washington-based World Service Authority. Only about six countries formally recognize this passport, though, according to the WSA, more than 180 countries, including South Africa, have accepted them on at least one occasion. The World Passport was the creation of American-born former Broadway actor and world government advocate Gary Davis, who in 1948 renounced his U.S. citizenship at the U.S. Embassy in Paris and declared himself a global citizen. Davis managed to travel widely, though he was frequently arrested, 
and became a minor celebrity stunts for, for minor celebrity for stunts like stealing forty-seven dollars worth of lingerie from a French department store in order to be arrested and avoid deportation. <laughs> Davis eventually settled in Vermont, where he died in twenty thirteen. In his later years, he had world passports sent to international fugitives like Julian Assange and Edward Snowden. The passport made news in early 2016 when the rapper and actor Yasin Bey, better known as Mos Def, attempted unsuccessfully to use one to travel from South Africa to the United States. As Bey eventually did return to the U.S. to play some concerts, he evidently never gave up his American passport. Sebastian also has one, but he said he rarely uses it, as few countries will accept it. As the journalist Atasa Abrahamian writes in her recent book on global citizenship, <coughs> The Cosmopolites, increasingly ours is a world of stateless natives and citizen strangers. More than ever, people want or need to belong to or be accepted in places they are not assigned to by accident of birth. This is becoming even more the case in the midst of, un of an unprecedented global child refugee crisis. In 2014, the UNHCR reported that 75% of Syrian refugees born in Lebanon since 2011 had not been properly registered, making them effectively stateless. The issue of people not properly recognized in the global country system is set to become a major crisis in years to come. As for Sebastian, he said life has improved immeasurably since his status was formalized. I became more like a human, he said. My human rights, as described in the UN Declaration of Human Rights, are restored because I have the freedom to move freely. He said he still has difficulty explaining his predicament when questioned by officials who simply can't conceive of someone not being a citizen of any country. He recalls one immigration officer asking he recalls asking one immigration officer to imagine what would happen if, like the Soviet Union, the United States one broke one day broke up into fifty separate republics. All those republics are going to make their own immigration law, he said. So a citizen of New Hampshire can't enter Connecticut without a visa. Say you're in California, but you were born in Texas. California won't let you stay, but Texas won't give you citizenship because your papers say you were born in the United States. You would become stateless. What Sebastian was asking, essentially, was for an American to imagine herself subject to the vagaries and legal complications of a post-stasis world map. Her answer? Don't be a smartass. <laughs> <laughs> I think I'll stop there and open up questions. Yeah, so thanks, Josh. It's a great book. My first book was called The Geography of Ethnic Violence, and it was on the secession of struggles. And one of the cases I looked at, I never wrote about, was Azatlan. Mm -hmm. Did you go and talk to anybody in New Mexico? So Azatlan is a, is a group of native Mexican, you want to say, who think that parts of the country still should be independent of the rest of the country, and they have a movement, and it's University of New Mexico has a chapter, and they have a map, and you can go look, go, it's A-T-Z-L-A-N, you can look it up online, and um, so, did you talk to anybody, you know, from that movement? No, I didn't. I mean, that there are so many uh, movements I could have covered. I mean, I think um, probably some of the issues that um, are at work there are things that I, I talked about in Apasasi with um, you know, indigenous sovereignty in the, in the Mohawk Nation and the kind of Iroquois leagues, um, efforts to kind of reestablish itself as a real, uh, you know, as as a kind of political sovereignty that existed before the U.S. and has tried with some mixed success in recent years to uh, reestablish itself as a meaningful political unit. There's actually a whole um, problem. The Iroquois League uh, prints passports, which occasionally people try to travel with. It was like the case a few years ago with the uh, lacrosse team. The lacrosse was a sport invented by, um, uh, by uh, Native Americans from that part of the country. Uh, they tried to travel to a tournament in, in Britain where, and it was actually the British government that wouldn't let them in. So, um, yeah, but no, I, I didn't get to Aslan. There, there's so many uh, cases I could have covered, but, uh, but I mean, next book. <laughs> and, and also Native Americans. New Mexico, I think, as a state within the United States, mm -hmm. the dynamics on territorial claims. It's really fascinating. Yeah. So if you do any offshoot, because you can go talk to all the native tribes, mm -hmm. and they have different conceptions of control of territory and how they think about it both in time. Mm -hmm. And I know you're writing a book about time and power, right? You're still working on that. Um, we should talk about it. It's fascinating. Um, I think you didn't expect that 
person who is filming this event comes from Nagorno Karabakh. Oh, all right. <laughs> yeah, there we go. <laughs> so my question is whether you visited Nagorno Karabakh, no, and no. whether there is something in your book about it. I, I'm afraid not. I, uh, <laughs> it's one of the ones I didn't get to. I mean, it's, uh, um, I had to kind of pick and choose a little bit just for uh, for logistical reasons and ease of travel, and so I tried to strive for some geographic balance. So Abkhazia wound up being my my Caucasus example, but it. Uh, I'd love to go to Nagorno Karabakh though. We should, we should uh, keep in touch. I'll, uh, <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll let you know. In the corner. Uh, you mentioned one or two nationalism theorists, uh, Gelna and then one other that I'm forgetting. Mm. Um, going through, did you do a lot of research, like reading about theories of nationalism <coughs> and trying to get a conception of that? And did one of them appeal to you, or did one of them make more sense than another? You mentioned like, the idea of imagination. Yeah. Is that what gripped you? Uh, yeah, I'm in a room where people catch the Benedict Anderson. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it's um, the, the book. It, it, it's published by Yale, so it's it sort of uh, has a little bit of academic press book about it. But I, uh, you know, I, I'm I'm a journalist, and I I tried to keep the sort of emphasis on the reporting and the sort of stories that I met. But I. Yeah, I, I did do a kind of crash course in uh, in theories of nationalism before I before I set out, and uh, um, I hopefully uh, that at least uh, informed some of the writing I did. But I, I um, was trying to write for um, you know a, a general audience. It's certainly not not an academic book, despite the cover looking sort of like an academic book. But, <laughs> so I uh, uh, and it being published by Yale University and by and being published by Yale. <laughs> You mentioned that there were several reasons for the global border stasis. Mm -hmm. um, you mentioned one as globalization, economic, and sort of integration. Um, what were some of the other reasons? Sure, yeah, well, I, I think there was, um, you know, the reason for the kind of wave of country creation I talked about in the second half of the 20th century was the end of European colonialism. Uh, most of the new countries that came into existence between World War II and the 1990s were, uh, you know, former European colonies that uh, became independent countries. What's interesting was, I think, at that same moment that, uh, you know, empires were collapsing, the sort of new countries that took their place uh, were very resistant to the idea of adjusting borders. I mean, if you, for instance, if you look in the bylaws of the African Union, uh, it's you know, an organization that is ostensibly dedicated to overthrowing the legacy of colonialism, they also basically forbid uh, the adjustment of the existing borders that were there uh, upon the achievement of independence. And you could say there's a bit of a contradiction there, because like, what could be a bigger vestige of colonialism than, than the actual shape of the countries you're talking about? But there was a real sort of resistance to that, and uh, I'd say that's true of the European Union, in the United Nations too. There's definitely sort of uh, norms in international law that um, uh, were established to discourage um, uh, territorial adjustment. One is the decline in interstate war is a big factor. Uh, country, you know, for all the conflict in the world, it's much rarer today for uh, countries to go to war with each other, uh, especially not go to war over territory, that uh, there's a bit of a chicken and egg problem, you could say. Is that the reason that borders don't change, or do countries not uh, go to war because they're not changing borders? Uh, notice the U.S. has been, uh, as a kind of status quo power, has also been resistant to secessionist movements. One people for, thing people forget is, even during the breakup of the Soviet Union, uh, the first Bush administration was pretty wary about that. They were, um, you know, George H. W. Bush gave a famous speech in Ukraine, which uh, got called the Chicken Kiev speech because he uh, said he, you know, basically discouraged Ukrainian nationalism and uh, upset a lot of neoconservatives and uh, and people in Ukraine, uh, you know, for basically arguing for the. Uh, 
continued territorial existence of the Soviet Union, not uh, the political system. Uh, and so, you know, the U.S. And, and that goes up to the Kurdish case. I mean, for all that we hear, like peons in the UN, uh, in the U.S. political debate, to you know the brave Kurds and how we have to do everything we can to support them and arm them. That that support continually over the decades has always stopped just short of independence. Uh, that's sort of like the one step that uh, we won't back them on. So. Um, you know, so I'd say all those are, are kind of factors that have kept the world, I mean, kept the world map for a few decades now, um, pretty stable. Uh, it, it's hard to predict whether that'll continue going forward. And, you know, interesting, like, uh, this current administration uh, seems to have maybe some different ideas about that. Um, the uh, Trump at one point talked about uh, banning the One China policy. Uh, there, you know, obviously the, uh, you could look at the uh, recognition of <coughs> Jerusalem as a kind of uh, reversal of the geographical status quo. Um, they, uh, you know, Trump has said he kind of uh, buys the Russian argument for the annexation of Crimea that, oh, they, they're Russian speakers, why shouldn't it be part of Russia? Like that, that's, that's, that's an argument that apparently uh, made some sense to him. So uh, maybe that uh, sort of traditional U.S. role of being skeptical about secessionism is not a, not a permanent thing. Yeah. Hi, hey, hey Joshua. Uh, just um, thanks for, so much for the uh, discussion. I'm very interested in what you said about if the imagination of people that creates a country. Mm -hmm. I just want to know, just perhaps slightly off the beaten path, but still related. Um, if your research uh, touched on anything about the psychology of nation states, why some certain countries after partition become a little more despotic, whereas some after, after various political movements still thrive, like Israel, Singapore had a more different political movement, but still thrive to some extent, whereas Pakistan went to despotic theocracy and some others just become tin pot dictatorships. Is there psychology of nation states? That I don't know if I got into that. One, one thing that did sort of strike me was um, you know, for all the people that talk about borders as artificial and that they don't, you know, they're just, it's just a line on the map, man. <laughs> uh, uh, that uh, after a while, uh, national borders can kind of create cultural differences. And this is something that uh, really hit home for me uh, when I was in Kurdistan, because you know, this is their greater Kurdistan encompasses territory in Iraq and Syria. And Iran, uh, and you, you know, you still hear people talk about, oh, we have to unify this as one state. We're all Kurds, you know, Kurdish Brotherhood. But there have emerged kind of vast political differences between you know the governing systems in Iraqi Kurdistan and Syrian Kurdistan. I mean, um, the Iraqi Kur the current Iraqi Kurdish government is much more kind of free market. It's like U.S. based, and you know, if you look at the uh, Know, ideology of the party currently in power in Syria and Kurdistan is this kind of quasi-anarchist view of, you know, abolishing the nation state and uh, replacing it with, you know, municipal federalism and things like that. Um, so, uh, you know, and another example you could look at is um, the Korean Peninsula that, uh, you know, there's still a unification ministry of the South Korean government. That's still ostensibly a, a national goal, but Clearly, in the decades since then, that there's not, I mean, obviously there's a vast political difference, and I think that's probably become a cultural difference as well. I mean, it, you know, it, it, apparently North Korean and South Korean languages are, have become pretty different over the last few decades. Uh, they're actually linguistic. Um, uh, they've sort of evolved in different ways. And if you look at polling among young, South Koreans, there's a lot less support for unification than among you know, people who remember when it was one country. So I, I think that's an idea where like the even if it, at one point people view these borders as something imposed on them, separating them from their you know cultural cohorts on the other side, that over time I think it can kind of create a, a cultural or psychological I've got a question about the symbolism of, of countries trying to 
and develop their sovereignty. So one of the things that newly sovereign countries are real big fans of are literally almost the, the accoutrements of sovereignty, like a flag, yeah. the coins, the you know the stamps, and so on and so forth. And you know, if you read like I, when, uh, when I went to Antarctica, I read about the history of, of countries trying to claim territory in Antarctica using truly bizarre methods to try to assert their sovereignty over territory that was basically um, uninhabitable. What I'm wondering though is that you know that conflicts though in the modern day with this notion of you know. Uh, actually governments being able to run reasonably well. So, I mean, for example, you know, I, and this I honestly don't know, do you, in the states that you visited, do they actually, that were, that at least had their control over territory, did you see the creation of currencies or stamps or, path, or you know, all of these things to try to convince the person, you know, the, the observer that this is an independent country, or in actuality, do they all wind up relying on the dollar or the Russian ruler or what have you? So I'm sort of curious in terms of the 21st century, to what extent was the the symbolism, you know, an important part of the diplomacy? Yeah, I remember the British comedian Eddie Izzard has this bit about how uh, Europeans conquered the world through the clever use of flags. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> you know, they're like, you can't come. This is our territory. Do you have a flag? <laughs> um, but uh, well, I, I think an example I would uh, I saw that really in um, Somaliland, which, as I mentioned, is is a place that has created all these things. They have. Um, uh, they're very much into the, uh, the kind of symbols you were talking about. Um, but one, uh, I guess one change you could point to is that um, nowadays people are much less likely to use paper currency in Somaliland. Like they're, to, to pay for something in Somaliland shillings, you literally like have this stack of bills uh, attached with a rubber band and you know, you. Uh, but, I mean, I, I couldn't do it. I would just hand it to people and they would take, take what they needed. And, you literally just give them like a brick of currency. I literally just give them a brick of currency. <laughs> Here, don't rip me off too much. No. But, uh, but now people pay for everything with cell phone credit. Uh, and then it's even gas or groceries, it's just how you buy um, your, uh, uh, what you need is you just sort of transfer um, uh, credit uh, from one phone to another. Uh, so you know I, that, that's interesting. Like as those kind of things become standardized uh, and, and like those kind of platforms uh, proliferate, I mean, is that going to decrease the importance of some of these symbols? Right. Uh, another kind of newer. I'm staying on that technology theme. Um, I talk a lot in the book about you know recognition and how what makes a country a country is that other countries recognize it. But uh, nowadays Google almost has. Uh, plays a sort of similar role because uh, Google Maps has become this really contested space for sovereignty movements. Uh, whereas people really fight to have their, you know, uh, you know, Crimea, for instance. You know, you know, Google faces this dilemma: Do you put it as part of Russia or part of Ukraine? And, and basically, Google is kind of uh, taking a step back. Whereas if you Look at Crimea and Google Maps from the U.S. It'll show, or from Ukraine, it'll show it as Ukrainian territory. If you do it from Russia, it'll show it as part of Russian territory. So they, they try to like wash their hands of it. Uh, but another thing is the uh, the two-letter uh, country codes, right. domain names. Um, so that's a um, uh, so only nation states can get a two-letter code. Um, so if you're like so, for instance, when I when you're in uh, Iraqi Kurdistan, you get you, a website there. It's going to be .iq. You're in Somalia, Somaliland. It's going to be .so, which is the Republic of Somalia one. Uh, and like Kurdistan has managed to get a KRD, which is a three-letter one, but they they're not quite at two-letter status. So, I mean, that, that's kind of like a become a new uh, a new one of these kind of nation state. Symbolism uh, factors. Yeah, um, the word nation and state are often misused sure. interchangeably by people. Although state is a political entity and nation is a group of people share a common identity to a certain degree. Um, after visiting Sealand, Northern Sudan, and um, the one I couldn't remember, uh, what's the one? Um, Liberland. Liberland. Thank you. Um, after visiting these um, self-proclaimed states yeah. with no shared common identity, almost 
privatized by yeah, yeah. one or two founders. Um, do you think uh, in our society today the concept of state can still exist independent from the concept of a nation? Yeah, I mean, I think particularly in the U.S., those two words are used kind of interchangeably. Uh, I think in other countries, people are more careful about drawing that nation versus state um, distinction. Uh, one of the reasons I use countries in the book is it's kind of a, like a little more of a generic term, uh, which is uh, and it kind of a lot. Often, what I'm talking about is actual territory. So, like a country kind of connotes land. I would say so. It's it's like a physical piece of land on the map, and um, uh, and that was partly to sort of avoid that problem you're talking about. I mean, I, I think with you know people talk about um, states being artificial. You know, some uh, you know Belgium, for instance. You know, so, uh, people talk about like, one that's uh, sort of cobbled together of two different, you could say, two different nations, England or something. Yeah. Um, but you know they're. As I mentioned before, when I was talking about the problem of secessionism and this issue of minorities, that there are not that many pure nation states in the world. There are, you know, like this, like race hand, maybe. Japan, although I, I met the uh, soccer team from the United Koreans of Japan, and they, they acted different. <laughs> uh, but, uh, uh, but Japan more so than, than others, certainly. Uh, and so, you know, I, I think you hear, and you hear sometimes, like, the current some of these governments in Central Europe now, like particularly the current government of Hungary, talks about you know where we live in, uh, you know Europe is a, has a history of nation, a uh, history of nations. You know, it's uh, a community of nations is the phrase that uh, you hear a lot from the European far right. This idea that states will be um, kind of uh, sounds I guess it's sinister to say ethically <laughs> pure, but that's kind of what they're talking about. Um, but you know. If you look at history, like the reason, it's not like an accident that Hungary is as homogenous as it is today. It's sort of centuries of, of war and genocide and ethnic cleansing that uh, got uh, Hungary to be uh, as overwhelmingly Hungarian as it is now. So, so I get, I get a little, I get a little uh, uh, nervous when I hear people talk about like certain countries being natural or, or sort of. Uh, you know, obviously, you know, historically, historically homogenous nation states. Yeah. Did you encounter any particular solutions to the problem of the 12 million counting stateless people? And if so, were there any that were specifically interesting or maybe viable? Yeah, well, I mean, there's, I mean, there's like weird ones. It's like, uh, so I, I actually skipped, uh, skipped over this paragraph when I was reading because it's getting, getting a little long, but uh, there's, uh, so Kuwait, for instance, has a large stateless population. There's people called the Bidun, who are uh, um, sort of formerly nomadic people who uh, weren't registered as citizens when Kuwait became independent. Uh, and, uh, and weirdly what they did, rather than just giving them citizenship, is they purchased citizenship for the Bidun from Comoros, which is a country in the Indian Ocean that was sort of willing to is one of these countries that will sell you a passport, basically. And so Kuwait, rather than just like giving citizenship, these people like bought it for them from this other country in the Indian Ocean. Um, <laughs> no. And I, I, I referred to um, Atasa Abrahamian's book, which, which I really recommend. It's good, the Cosmopolites. And that, okay. That's kind of her main uh, uh, she her main case study uh, is is that. Um, so that's one. I mean. Uh, but yeah, I mean, it's a problem, and if, and, uh, you know, and, and, and we, there isn't really a substitute right now to a national government as something that can uh, protect people's human rights. I mean, it's, it's the, uh, uh, and, you know, you, you can see this in Myanmar now, that the, the first thing uh, any government does before uh, you know, ethnic violence or, or ethnic cleansing begins as it sort of denies citizenship to people. And that was, you know, as true in 1930s Germany as it is in Myanmar today. Um, and uh, so, yeah, I mean, it, it is a dilemma, and I think it's a growing one, as I mentioned, that uh, um, with this sort of large 
population of Syrian refugees, many of whom are not registered in the countries where they're living, um, we're going to have a large um, population of people without without passports. And um, I'm not sure what the solution to that is. Well, uh, thank you all for coming. I believe that uh, if you want to buy Josh's book, I believe there is a bookseller on hand. Yes. Yes. There we go. Um, and so I would strongly encourage you to buy one. And I believe Josh has also volunteered to autograph it for you. So uh, if you want to stick around, please get that. Otherwise, please uh, join me in giving a warm hand to Josh. Thank you.